Oh, oh, we have the wall. Come on. Oh, we can make it. <laughs> Just check it. Oh, you're one thorough hippo. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> All righty then. <laughs> oh, my God. Any stuff that doesn't suck. All right, I know I've been doing this like YouTube stuff for like a little over a year. Wait, hold on. A year? Oh God, I've been emotionally and physically drained. Everything has been a weird blur. Dear God, put me out of my misery. And if you've watched any amount of my videos, then you can kind of pick up that I wear my influences on my sleeve. What can I say? I got a lot of love in my heart and a ton of worms in my brain. And that's why you can tell that I love adult swim like yeah i kind of ripped into it when i made that moral world video and yeah i still stand by that but i fucking love adult swim all right yeah they got issues and not everything they put out bangs but when it does hit oh ah woo! i want you to visualize this with me right now okay come here close your eyes now open them it's 12 a.m and you left the tv on and you hear this Congrats, you are now permanently scarred for life. This is basically what happened to me, but instead it was a sleepover at a friend's house. I already kind of established before, my ass didn't get anything except Disney XD for a while. I wasn't watching shit. The only reason we even had cables because my parents are Latino, and there's no way in hell they're gonna miss Chivas versus America, right? But what I'm getting at is Adult Swim has had an immeasurable impact on my life. Everything that Adult Swim has done for the culture, for me personally, has made it so that no matter what, there will always be a spot for it in my heart. This shit made me who I am today from my personality, sense of humor, video topics, and hell, even aesthetics. I am dick riding this channel hard, and it's the reason I am the way I am now. That and like being left alone with the internet in the late 2000s, early 2010s as a kid. But that's besides the point. So if you hate my ass for whatever reason, uh, blame him. I love the young people. Keep in mind, I haven't had like cable since like high school. So all my opinions are based on like watching the shows on Hulu back in middle school and like HBO Max recently. It wasn't really until high school that I watched Adult Swim the way it was intended. Late at night only to get to school and fall asleep in first period because I wanted to watch Mike Tyson Mysteries. And I guess if you're a little iPad baby, the main way you consume these shows was through like, I don't know, fucking TikTok. Bro, this next generation of kids are going to be weird. So you know what? I've gotten a ton of requests to cover all sorts of things and maybe I will eventually, but for all the shows that I don't got enough thoughts to make a full like hour long video essay about, this seems like the next best option. And don't worry y'all, just cause I'm covering a show you like here doesn't mean I won't eventually make a long in-depth analysis on it if I feel like it. You know, if I have enough things to say, I will do it. So you're not missing out. Also some ground rules, all right? First, I'm only talking about original programming, meaning no Futurama or American Dead. Okay, 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 listen man, I counted and there's like 90 different series and I'm not trying to spend the rest of my life doing this. Don't worry though, I'm not freaking about you, all right? Those are coming later. Same goes for Tanami, man. Like, listen, Tom, I love you, buddy. I can't. I can't, okay? Also, to help keep my sanity, I'm watching a minimum of 10 episodes of a series before giving my opinion on it. And if I really enjoy my time with it, I might watch more. Hell, even if I didn't, I still ended up watching way more of these shows than I expected. So fuck it. Let's just jump right into it. God knows this video spiraled out of control. We gotta get going. Okay, we gotta get going. This is Every Adult Swim Show Ranked, Volume 1. Okay, so a quick history lesson for all y'all not in the know. So early Cartoon Network was like, <laughs> weird. For a good portion of its early life, CN was basically only known for reruns of cartoons. Specifically, Cartoon Network's parent company, Turner Broadcasting, had the rights to air Warner Bros. and Hanna-Barbera cartoons. So you know Boomerang? It was basically just like that, but the entire channel, and while it was alright and novel at the time to have a channel dedicated to cartoons for all 24 hours out of the day, Mike Lazo, the then Vice President of Programming at Cartoon Network, was kinda pissed 
at only being known as just the Hanna-Barbera rerun channel. That combined with the network's realization that childless man-baby adults like me would watch the network late into the night made it so that there was an incentive to try to cater and monetize that demographic. The only problem was that for a channel that aired kids cartoons, there was no way advertisers wanted to buy an ad spot during a time of the day where most kids would be asleep. Problems only piled on as even though everyone, including the execs, wanted to make some original content, Ted Turner had rejected giving the network any more budget. So with no money except for the existing bit left to the network for the upkeep and branding of the channel, a team of creatives and execs got together and did the only thing they could, work with the limitations they were given. Space Ghost Coast to Coast was released in 1994 and was the brainchild of a whole bunch of talented people, but primarily Mike Lazo and C. Martin Crocker, two men who had been working at Cartoon Network for a while and during a meeting in which everyone was trying to come up with a name for a marathon based on the 60s Hanna-Barbera character Space Ghost, Khaki Jones, a future writer for the show, came up with the title Space Ghost Coast to Coast and the rest just came flowing as the mix of limited budget and funny premise combined to create what was at that point the first ever original Cartoon Network production. Other than the Moxie show, but we don't really talk about that one. Now my first experience with the show was mostly through word of mouth. Like I said, my ass didn't get anything besides Disney XD for a while. The raunchiest shit I was watching on that channel was probably like, push hooks. I know what you did. I know what you are! Celebrities, huh? So celebrities are more important than the safety and well-being. Nobody of cares, Moby. Nobody cares. I do remember watching an episode once in freshman year of high school and being mesmerized by purely just the vibe of the whole thing. But to be honest, when watching some of these shows for this video, I was kind of the least excited for Space Ghost out of all of them. I don't know, maybe just because I live in an age where Space Ghost's influence and legacy has rubbed off on everything. I wasn't too thrilled to revisit it. The concept was novel at the time. That of a washed up cartoon has been doing interviews, but you know, I'm fucking 20 dog. I don't know who the fuck Susan Powder is. Do you know? Do you know who Susan Powder is? If you answer yes, I'm going to kill you, man. We're putting your ass in the device. <laughs> But lucky enough for me though, I had a lot of fun, but not gonna lie, it definitely took a little bit for me to come around to it. I definitely got the feeling that I would have had a lot of a better time during the beginning of the series if I was stoned. Wait, 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 my, my bad, I forgot to even tell you what the fuck the show even is. Man, why the fuck do you guys even watch these videos? Before becoming a washed up hack, Space Ghost was a Z-tier superhero cartoon made by Hanna-Barbera in 1966 and that apparently lasted all of like one year washed up and with nothing else to do space ghost now hosts his very own late night talk show along with his slaves i, I mean friends zorak a green evil mantis guy in charge of the show's band and moltar a being made of lava who wears a hazmat suit both of which hate the show hate space ghost and just hate about everybody <laughs> especially zorak you like the zorak do you oh yeah oh yeah Zorak. Looks like you've got some fans. Fight me, Metallica. In the original series, they were villains, and now they're kept as prisoners forced to help Space Ghost do his show. And while the show does start kind of slow and there's no overarching narrative or whatever, each episode is really carried by the banter between these three lovable assholes, messing with guests and each other a lot of the time. Honestly, some of the best bits come from Zorak and Space Ghost fucking with each other. Look, shoot a ray and you get a word. Shoot an adjective. Shoot a proper noun. Shoot the theory of evolution. The show loves its non-sequitur jokes, and for the most part they land and other times it just kind of meanders a bit, ultimately feeling a bit aimless. Which is not necessarily bad, it's just you gotta be in the mood for it. My favorite fun fact about the writing is that Mike Lazo loved non-sequiturs so much that they actually had to like argue with him in the writer's room to get him to start including jokes with like actual punchline. I watched more than just the 10 episodes of Space Ghost and hopped around between seasons and fortunately it does seem as time went on like most shows they really start hitting their stride. Space Ghost goes from this campy old superhero to a fucking narcissistic lunatic just completely abusing the fact that everybody has to put up with him. 
At least in the show they do. But in real life, when interviewing the guests, in the beginning of the series, a lot of them just fucking bailed. Just fed up with the stupid questions the interviewee would give them. My absolute favorite episode has to be Season 8, Episode 1, Baffler Mail, where Space Coast gets a sponsorship from a fast food company that's paying for his new houseboat, but under the condition that these little fucking fast food fuckers invade his show. Oh, wait, hold up. These guys kind of look familiar, don't they? Hylock, the hunger, hater, tater. Oh, wait, hold on, hold on. Never, never mind. Who the fuck is this guy? That ain't Frylock. That is not the baby. Who the fuck? The episode has some fucking incredibly weird and funny moments. So wait a minute. In particular, just the fact that these characters are supposed to be the same ones from Aqua Teen Hunger Force, despite not sounding or looking alike at all, is incredible considering that this is kind of like a backdoor pilot. But in my opinion, everything surrounding the show is way more interesting than the show itself. No offense. Going back to what I said earlier about the budget, the show by like modern standards, I don't know, you might say kind of looks bad. And while I can definitely see people's issue with how cheap the show looks, I think that not only is the show insanely charming in its presentation, but also impressive for the limited resources the studio had. Hell, the first pilot episode cost them around $25,000 and was cut together on one guy's computer in a hot ass broom closet. Just for reference, many animated cartoons could cost anywhere between a couple hundred thousand dollars to even a million for a single episode. The original Space Coast pilot that they sent to another animation company to animate cost a hundred thousand dollars for two minutes of animation. It was scrapped for looking too clean and that's when Mike decided, fuck it, we can just do this shit ourselves. So $25,000 is fucking nothing. On top of that, they were working with such low budgets that everybody working on the show in the beginning were just completely unpaid for their work. Having to make Space Ghost on top of their already existing jobs at Cartoon Network, working to write scripts and animate the show. And while there is a very justifiable reason to have an ethical dilemma about workers' compensation, this to me shows how dedicated everybody on the crew was to not only making the show, but turning Cartoon Network around from just a channel that aired reruns. Again, while the budget was small, the whole crew was incredibly creative in the way they pulled it off, literally recycling existing cells of the character and reusing them in different scenarios to save time on animation. Along with some original drawings by C. Martin Crocker, who, alongside being an animator, was also the voice of Zorak and Moltar. Turner Broadcasting owned CNN, so they could just pull celebrities into the CNN recording studio and fuck with them. And while animated characters and real people interacting has existed for a while, even before Space Goes, the team still tried to find a way to make the interactions feel real. And while they later on figured out that they could just film an interview and then script around it, I much prefer the original idea of just having Andy Merrill, writer and voice of Brack, wearing a Space Ghost costume while interviewing the guests. On top of this, the whole production was a risk. Airing a show meant for older teens and adults on a kids channel was a ballsy move. Because even though the success of The Simpsons and Beavis and Butthead have proved that adult animation could be and is successful, pulling it off on this low of a budget and in a pre-adult swim cartoon network seemed baffling. Jim Samples, the VP of Cartoon Network at the time, said that he felt like he was putting his job on the line by letting Lazo go through with the idea. Now some of you guys might have raised an eyebrow there, and yeah fine alright you caught me, this isn't exactly an adult swim show, I lied. I'm a fucking fuck boy. What, what, what do you expect? You got me now. You got me now. You got me now. Oh, you figured me out. You fucking income fucking poop. Some of you might be saying if Adult Swim didn't come out until 2001, then why are we talking about a show that came out all the way in 1994? And I have a good reason for that. Because, to put it quite simply, all of this, these fucking 90 shows that I have to go through, would not exist without him. He is that guy, all right? Put some respect on Space Ghost's fucking name. You wanna talk about a playmaker? That's a playmaker! He made the play! Space Ghost Coast to Coast was the blueprint that helped launch the careers of so many talented people, and it was the foundation in which 
Adult Swim grew out of. Everything from how the show is animated to the writing and even the attitude of the show influenced everything. Not only just a batch of shows that would premiere on Adult Swim in 2001, but even after that and beyond that. Space Ghost's most obvious influence being The Eric Andre Show, a show that took the concept behind Space Ghost, the stupid non sequiturs, the idea behind just fucking with guests and crank that shit to the max. And uh, man, I am excited to talk about that show. Space Coast helped launch the careers of so many talented people, giving them a platform to create shows like Aqua Teen, The Brack Show, Harvey Birdman. Hell, even in the early days of Tsunami before Tom hosted, Moltar was there on the ones and twos exposing western audiences to anime for what was to a lot of people, their first time. And while it's entirely possible that at some other point down the line that Cartoon Network would have tried their hand at original programming, there's a very real possibility that Adult Swim would not be here without Space Ghost. That means no original programming, no revivals of Family Guy and Futurama, no bumpers, hell, no me. That moral oral video was the whole reason I wanted to do videos in the first place, and the insane reception to it convinced me that this is something I wanted to do. My life would not be the same without this show. So you know what? Even though this shit didn't connect with me as much as I wanted it to, it made me appreciate the fact that it did exist. Because without it, some of my favorite shows of all time wouldn't have had any other place to go. Are you seriously going to try and tell me that any other network would have fostered the environment to let shows like Tim and Eric or Moral Oral thrive, much less air? No, and for that I can't express how happy I am that a tiny group of weirdos came together and decided to take a chance. Uh, uh, fuck it, I don't know, put some around here I guess. Space Ghost was the test that showed that original adult programming on Cartoon Network could not only work, but be successful. And after the creation of William Street, which serves as the production company for many Adult Swim original programming, including Space Ghost and the three other shows that would soft launch Adult Swim, Mike Lazo approached Jim Samples about making the, at the time, unnamed animated adult block from basically no budget. They were given a year to come up with the name, the brand, the lineup, and after running through a bunch of names that honestly kind of sucked dick, they finally settled on Adult Swim. And while I always intended the series to just be me giving my feelings on individual shows I would have never had the chance to talk about any other way, I also kind of want this to serve as a retrospective dive into the different periods of Adult Swim's history. Because as weird as it is to say, the shows are only really a part of what gives this network its identity. The branding, the presentation of Adult Swim is just as important to making it what it is in my mind, and the story of how we got here is just as interesting. Despite Mike Lazo's hatred of the name, the name Adult Swim was probably the best way of giving the block its very early identity. The bumps were an integral part of Adult Swim's DNA as it served dual functions of not only introducing a new audience to a brand new lineup of shows, but also getting rid of the old audience. Kids. Early Adult Swim bumpers were often made with the express purpose of scaring off little kids, a tradition that still lives on to this day. <laughs> Man, what the fuck? It would feature old wrinkly seniors from the MLK Jr. Natatorium in Atlanta and a lifeguard on the megaphone as an announcer. All kids out of the pool for adult swim. All kids out. The message they were trying to send home with these was that if you were a little kid who accidentally stayed up too late, then get your ass to bed because this is not for you. I don't know man, these bumpers are just so good. The vibe was strong and the music, oh god the music. During some of the bumpers they would play Decode by Dust Devil in the background and if you watch any of my videos you know how much I overuse this song, but it's just so good man. On top of how these bumpers helped build an amazing vibe that made Adult Swim stand out, it also helped fill the airtime, as most of the shows on Adult Swim were around like 13 minutes, which is extremely short. Animation is expensive, and Mike Glazer wanted to use the budget to greenlight as many ideas as possible, to create new and inventive things, and shit, I don't know if I've sufficiently drilled this into your head by now or not, but they ain't got no money! <laughs> Every single aspect of Adult Swim helped create something that felt more than just a normal TV block. It felt like a group of creatives working together to make things they loved, mostly because it was. From what I read, it was partially pretty communal. 
people would just bounce around and work with each other on different shows. Everyone would share their processes and fuck around. And well, yeah, there were problems. Not everyone felt entirely part of this community. There was a rebellious attitude to this early stage of Adult Swim that made it really memorable. Beyond that, there's so much more I want to talk about, from their music labels and working with indie artists, their stunts and different events, and I don't know how I'll manage to fit all this shit into these videos. I don't know, this might even be the last one of these segments, or some, I don't know, God knows I'm lazy and stupid as hell. So <laughs> we'll see what I'm able to cook up, alright? And hell, if you guys like this video, let me know in the comments or by dropping a like, but let me know if I should even continue this series or if I should just take it out back in. Alright, what do you want to do? Do you want to make love, darling? What did you say to me?! Ooh. Starting off the first of the three Space Ghost Coast to Coast spin-offs is The Brack Show, featuring Brack, a weird alien cat boy. Uh, not really sure what he is. Hi, my name's Pussycat. But living with his mom and dad, along with Zorak. I would say he was his best friend, if it weren't for the fact that it would be a complete lie. You mean the devil? <laughs> You're stupid. And because of that, I'm leaving. Mods. Crush this goal, thank you. Before watching the show for this video, I had heard practically nothing about it. And don't get me wrong, we haven't touched like the really obscure shows, but Brack, despite being a large part of early Cartoon Network and Adult Swim's history, is kinda cast aside the cultural memory from what I can glean. I don't know, it's weird, especially considering he was up there constantly with characters like Space Ghost and Zorak, having his own little specials and even hosting another show called Cartoon Planet. That and the Brack show is pretty solid. Brack, remember that even though a man may have more hairs on his head than there are stars in the sky, that does not mean that he can plan a successful party that movie stars will attend and enjoy responsibly. Don't you agree, Mother? I wasn't listening. Like, I don't know, it's definitely the least interesting of the Space Ghost spinoffs to me. Not nearly as funny as Birdman or Aqua Teen. But even then, the show is redeemed by just how charming Brack is, and how fucking funny Dad is. Now, it's my turn. Are you familiar with the Boston Bob? Huh? <sighs> oh? Or how about the Fresno Floater? <laughs> Brack has this boyish charm that makes him so endearing in a weird way. He's like a kid and has this naive trust in everything. Something Zorak takes advantage of all the time. Some of the best episodes revolve around completely mundane premises that are taken to the extreme by some random factor. Like dad trying to get a job before being attacked by giant ants. Or dad running for the homeowners association president against an eldritch being. Or dad and mom running over Zorak killing him and eating his remains to get rid of the evidence. Yeah, you could probably tell I really fucking like the dad character. In a way, I think that the Bragg show reminds me of Moral Oral. And the fact that they're both parodying the nuclear suburban family. But unlike Moral Oral, it's not nearly as funny, nor does it really strive to be any more than just a parody. Fully content in being just completely stupid for the sake of laughs. And I don't know, I think when a lot of media tries to be these story-driven comedy dramas, that an episodic show with zero stakes can be incredibly refreshing and nice. But the problem with The Brack Show, and C-Lab, and how even Birdman to some extent, is that structure-wise, they're all kinda similar, fulfilling more or less the same niche for me. And maybe that's part of the reason that The Brack Show fell to the wayside, being cancelled after only 28 episodes. This cold is making my wiener small! Ah! This is stupid! I wish we weren't penguins and that our show wasn't cancelled! Besides that, I would say that The Brack Show is a pretty solid C-tier show. Ah! Watch it, or don't. Who cares? Why don't you just run down to Softies Hardware and buy some? Because giant worm repellent costs money, comrade mother. And money is nothing but an evil yoke that the capitalist slave masters have chained to the neck of the working class oxen. That was Doghouse Charlie's caption from yesterday. Sometimes he mixes in a political message with his special brand of humor. <laughs> Man, we thought that Kraken had you. Well, he woulda, if Goo Goo Yasha hadn't shown up. Don't thank me, thank Papoombi. Oh? <laughs> what about the consequences? What the hell are they gonna do about it? 
Z Lab 2021 was created by Adam Reed and Matt Thompson, two guys who just got jobs as production assistants at Cartoon Network and would go on to make things far more popular than this show. And arguably better. Things such as what they're most known for. High Noon Tunes. Nah, I'm fucking with y'all. They made like 13 seasons of Archer. How the hell did Archer get 13 seasons? Anyway, the early days of Adam Reed's and Matt Thompson's careers were incredibly funny and weird to say the least. Adam Reed was only able to get a job at Cartoon Network doing grunt work because a random guy at Turner had hired him on the spot to watch every single episode of the Flintstones and try to find an episode with no dinosaurs in it. What the fuck? This man was paid $4 an hour to log every time he saw a dinosaur in the Flintstones for a fucking month. But after suffering through trying to pay rent, Adam eventually got a job at Cartoon Network due to his encyclopedic knowledge of the Flintstones. Man, I hope one of my hyperfixations lands me a job. After landing the PA job at Cartoon Network, he would meet his longtime collaborator, Matt Thompson. And eventually, after a while of doing busy work, would be able to make bumpers for the channel for their block, The High Noon Tunes. An idea they got greenlit after drunkenly coming into a pitch meeting and pulling whatever they could out of their ass. From that was born their first real production and writing gig, where they'd go and do hand puppets. I know this might seem like a little pointless, but the reason I bring this up is because I absolutely love this little tidbit about the behind the scenes of the show. They would just like routinely come in and just be completely washed, just wasted out of their mind and film these shorts. And like, yeah, it's pretty fucking obvious. <laughs> There would be empty beer cans littering the floors around the sets, and they'd even get in trouble for lighting a prop spaceship on fire during a shoot. Anyways, it was under these circumstances that Adam and Matt created the first couple pilots for C Lab 2021 after stealing the master tapes of the original C Lab. Originally pitching it in 1994 and being rejected, it wasn't until around 1999 when Mike Lazo told the pair about how they were making Adult Swim that the show was greenlit and found a place where it could finally air. Also, they kind of were like forced into signing the contract to make the show or else they'd get like sued for stealing the tapes. So, damn boy! <laughs> now, on to the actual show. C Lab 2021 is a workplace comedy about a bunch of insane assholes who work at an under the sea research center, with most of all the characters, except for a few, operating on a spectrum between complete psychopath and complete dumbass. In the end, it would kind of look something like this Hey, little dying guy! You like swimming? Afraid not, sir. My incredibly rare disease makes it far too dangerous. That's great! Cause we're gonna be doing lots of swimming. My favorite character definitely being Captain Murphy, just being both insanely stupid and psychotic. Like most of early Adult Swim stuff, there's no plot being carried by funny character interactions, but unlike other Adult Swim shows, it's not that good. I'm sorry, that was a joke, all right? But like, I don't know. I find the show hard to talk about because I feel really conflicted about it. I think it really just depends if I have the patience for it on any particular given day. Because when I first watched the first season, I got really into it. Maybe just because it was a nice change of pace and format from Space Ghost, while still very obviously taking a lot of inspiration from it. Just look at how these two shows are animated. How are you gonna tell me that ain't the father? Like, come on now. But like, while re-watching some episodes recently, I don't know if it's just because I was in like a particularly bad mood, but I just did not have the patience for it at all, man. Like, I think giving it a bit of distance has made me realize that the show is like both hit or miss with its episodes, but also just one of those things you need to be in the mood for. I watched the first two seasons and some of the third then bounced around. And I think the show's biggest strength definitely has to be the fact that Captain Murphy works great off everyone. Like in one episode, White Debbie is filled with a sudden urge to have a baby and then holds an interview with everyone in the crew to see who would be a good dad. But Murphy just misconstrues the situation and thinks that she's testing all of them to see which one she'll adopt. 
Yeah, doctor. Yes. Yes. God, I love your brain. It's so Stop big. that. Uh, <laughs> mommy, don't talk like that. I fucking love this joke, but the problem with the show for me is that it kind of meanders aimlessly. The show has a lot of conversational humor, which if the conversation is based around the joke that's actually funny, it works really well. Feeling intentionally awkward and uncomfortable. I've got something for you. What is it? A book. What's the book? A modest proposal. By whom? Jonathan Swift. And what is the book about? Eating babies. But when the joke doesn't land, it kind of just wanders around the same limp bit for like a minute. <laughs> I hate the bizarros. Don't you mean you hate the bizarros? And the weird thing is the show seems like it kinda knows that. This show sucks. The writers absolutely suck. I don't know, I've considered the show the black sheep of the original Adult Swim lineup. Not really as memorable or as funny as the other shows that it shares a spot with, and when you're running up against Aqua Teen, it's like, yeah, it's not. I, I ain't gonna hold you, bro. Fuck it, though. It's your life. Any, uh, any C-Lab questions? I have a C-Lab question. Why isn't C-Lab Aqua Teen? I'll be crying if I look like that, too, bro. That's fucked up what they be doing to y'all. I ain't even gonna hold you, bro. I be saying that's fucked up, like, bro, fuck it though, bro, it's your life. But really, the best episode of C-Lab for me has to be the really unconventional ones, like Fusebox, where it's all just one shot of the base for like eight minutes while a radio show basically plays out, where all the characters try to turn the power back on before Stormy just fucking explodes. That was about this close from Stormy! Stormy. <laughs> oh my god, it's Stormy! Holy god. God. Another great one is 7211 where the entire episode is just a serious episode in which the crew save a nuclear submarine just for this one joke at the very end credits of the episode. Hmm. Okay. Adam Reed himself has stated he's had trouble coming back and watching C-Lab, and I get why. He describes it as looking back at your high school journal, and as a Z-tier YouTuber, I can relate to how he views his work. Well, actually, I think he has a more mature stance on his work, accepting it for what it is, and realizing that he could have done better. Meanwhile, that's the place I want to get with my work, but for the most part, I think it's a weird self-esteem issue. Like, I rewatched my Moral Oral video recently, and realistically, I think it's a good video. I'm proud of it, but also the hater in me cannot fathom why anyone watches my bullshit. Thank you to everyone who does though, your comments are genuinely so fucking sweet and not gonna lie, I've teared up reading some of them, so thank you. But despite all the problems with the show, I don't know, I feel like if it catches me in the right mood, I do think that it has a charm that stops me from writing it off. How I'm making it sound like I hate the show, but in all honesty, it's pretty alright. Oh, I'd place it here or somewhere, I don't know. Don't go away, because we'll be right back after these messages with a super fantastic new C-Lab premiere. Bro, this is really how they end the series. It's been like a minute self-deprecatingly like comparing itself to Aqua Teen and then fade to black, holy shit. <laughs> My name is Shake Zula, the Mike Ruler, the old schooler. You want a trip? I bring it to. <coughs> uh, fuck my bad. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I ruined it. Created by Matt Malero and Dave Willis, who you might know from Talking Tom as the landlord. Here comes Aqua Teen Hunger Force, baby! The longest running Adult Swim show before Rick and Morty, arguably their most successful. The show is about three talking food things, Master Shake, Frylock, and Meatwad, and their bald New Jersey neighbor Carl, kind of just hanging out. And while it seems like a really nothing premise, which it is, they managed to do a lot of different shit with the show. Like one episode, the gang will enlist in the Marines only to run away to Canada, where Frylock gets tortured by Jigsaw. Or another personal favorite, the weight loss competition. Doing this thing right now, and it is in your. I win, brother. I win, I win, I win. In your face, Frylock, I win. 
Come on, where's everybody going? Man, why does skinny Carl look like a cholo, man? The best aspect of the show is just how strong each character is. Well, not like super in-depth characters, just their personalities, voice acting, delivery, make it so that these characters can and are put into basically any scenario, and it just kind of works. Master Shake, who's voiced by the incredible Dana Snyder, has such a memorable, nasally tight voice that gives so much life to this insane, selfish psychopath. Hey, Dan, what happened to your eyes? They look real. Shut up. There can be only one. Meatwad is this childlike wad of meat that's voiced by Dave Willis. He just mumbles and I don't know, he's kind of cute. I love him. Here, how'd you like to get down with some real gangsters from the 15th century? But, blue oven. Are they down with the peepots? Well, they wore pantaloons back then, Meatwad. Shit, bro, you get shot with that mouth. But just because he kind of acts like a kid, it doesn't really mean he's cutesy. Instead, he's also kind of an asshole. Everyone is, but what I enjoy a lot from Meatwad was his little dynamic with Frylock. They have this kind of parental relationship where Frylock looks after Meatwad and shit. Like in one episode, Frylock buys Meatwad a toy despite him being a grown ass man. Oh, it's my popsicle. Please, wait a second. I require a popsicle every 15 minutes. You obviously did not read the memo. Is this your memo? I don't even know what this is. Frylock, voiced by the fantastic Carrie Means, is the only competent and sort of normal member of the group. He's smart and for the most part kind of put together, but that doesn't really stop him from having his own psychotic moments. The creators of the show always intended it to just be guys hanging out. Actually getting the show to resemble the end product was a bit of a struggle with Adult Swim. The show wasn't always as aimless. In the original pitch, the characters were mascots for a fast food company who were also detectives, solving mysteries and crimes and shit, hence the Aqua Teen Hunger Force name or whatever, I don't know. None of these words apply to this show at all, these motherfuckers are pushing 40. I am 30 or 40 years old and I do not need this. Well, which one? Is it 30 or 40? I don't know! Do you understand me? This premise would last all of one episode. <laughs> The creators explained that the only reason behind the original concept was to help with pitching the show. Apparently Adult Swim didn't really see the appeal to just a bunch of characters sitting around. The original pitch was apparently awful, as Adult Swim was not receptive to it at all really. Little remnants of the show can be found on shit like in the Space Coast Coast to Coast episode Baffler Meal. Correction, correction, correction. Alright, so in like the Space Coast section, I said this. In particular, just the fact that these characters are supposed to be the same ones from Aqua Teen Hunger Force, despite not sounding or looking alike at all, is incredible considering that this is kind of like a backdoor pilot. So yeah, I was like <laughs> lying during that segment, only because I thought it would be extremely funny to mention that Aqua Teen premiered in 2000. Meanwhile, this fucking episode came out in 2003. These characters were nothing like this by then. Despite feeling like Aqua Teen was nothing more than an afterthought for the network, the crew was able to make the show they wanted and somehow despite all the odds and the show looking like it was made in Photoshop, partially because it is, the show was a hit, going on to this day with a new season reviving the show in the works. And I hate to be like the billionth guy that talks about this, so I'm gonna do it quick but I can't explain how much I love this episode without explaining this. But in 2007, in order to advertise the release of the new Aqua Teen Hunger Force movie, Adult Swim teamed up with a marketing company that hung up little LED lights of the Moon Knight characters around different cities. And even though a good amount of time had passed, a lot of people, including the government, were on their post 9 11 panic surveillance state shit. 9 11 was bad. <laughs> So when the cops were informed of a suspicious electronic device planted all around the city of Boston, the entire city went crazy. Bomb squads were called, moon knights were detonated, Adult Swim burnt their crops and delivered a plague upon their houses. It was a fucked up time to live in Boston. The whole fallout was big as people got arrested, gym samples, the VP of Cartoon Network stepped down, and Cartoon Network had to pay $2 million in damages, and during all of this, Dave and Matt were laughing their fucking asses off. They thought it was hilarious how riled up everyone got and wanted desperately to make an episode about it. Something Lazo told them to wait on, at least until the heat died down. 
the episode was partially made and left unfinished, never to be officially released, until someone leaked it a couple years later. And while it's not finished, Unfinished Aqua Teen is basically just slightly worse looking Aqua Teen. It's a freaking light! Bomb! Light! Bomb! Light! Bomb! Light! Bomb! Light! Bomb! Light! It's a bomb! Will you shut the fuck up? It's a fucking fantastic episode. Genuinely, incredibly funny knowing the context. But sadly, the public would never see the new updated version release. That is, unless you went to the Boston Comedy Festival in 2023. These motherfuckers really went back and showed an updated version of the episode exclusively to the people of Boston. That is incredible. Sadly, we might never get to see that updated episode, but from the snippets I heard about it, it sounds hilarious. This is so fucking funny. If you want a more in-depth video about the situation, you could check out this video by Nick Tendo. He does a great job going into detail. I'm out of here. Worst day of my life. Alright, because I'm a complete dumbass and because of my really bad burnout, this video took a long time to finish making. In retrospect, I probably should have been writing the script while watching the shows and not like a week afterwards. My bad. But because of the 10 episode minimum rule I've set for myself, I've watched about this much of each show, or probably more by the time this video is out. But despite watching this one the least, I can easily say I really fucking liked Birdman. You guys from Florida? No. We're from the future. Yeah, the 21st century. The magnificent far-off year of 2002. Really? Man, I didn't expect to have so much fun watching this one. Maybe because I'm a sucker for courtroom lawyer shit. Just recently finished Better Call Saul. Jesus Christ, what a good fucking show Saul was. Oh my god. Okay, sorry, back on track. Harvey Birdman, while well, not on the same level as Aqua Teen, is underrated as hell, or at least the first season is. Harvey Birdman originally started off as just another old Hanna-Barbera superhero from the 60s. Just like Space Ghost, but like, if Space Ghost was a D-tier superhero, then Birdman was in fucking Z-tier. Put his ass in the shower tier. <laughs> But after Michael Oline and Eric Richter pitched Harvey Birdman to Lazo, the idea of taking Birdman from his failed superhero career and into the struggling lawyer was born. And as a lawyer, Harvey represents other Hanna-Barbera characters. Having bounced around seasons after season one, I think that the first season really does have some of the best episodes of the show. Like one episode, Harvey could be trying to get Fred Flintstone cleared off of Rico charges in a parody of The Sopranos, and the next he could just be defending Boo Boo from terrorist charges from the Fed. Would you consider yourself a revolutionary? Well, no, but I do believe corporations rob us of our dignity and independence, and that these systems must be ripped down, burnt down, or leveled by any force necessary. <gasps> but that's just one little bear's opinion. One of the best episodes for me, though, is definitely has to be the Scooby-Doo one, where Shaggy and Scooby had to fight phony drug charges. I don't know, like, usually I think it's really lazy whenever someone's idea of peak comedy is to take something innocent and make them say the fuck word. That's my creepy pasta. Mario says the fuck word. <laughs> like, it comes off like this picture. <laughs> Birdman, for the most part, does it in a way that's so much more charming than anything else, playing off popular tropes or inventing whole new ones with this cast of characters that are also so fucking wacky. <laughs> Guys, meet your new attorney, Mr. Birdman. Now, which one of you is Shaggy? <laughs> the biggest surprise for me is just how much the show tackles real-world subjects. Like, beyond the silly shit, there's also episodes where the Jetsons go back in time and sue everyone for climate change, fucking up the Earth. There's an episode critiquing post-9-11 hysteria in the Patriot Act, calling it out as a way to spy and surveil its citizens under the guise of protection. Like, I don't know, don't misconstrue what I'm saying. This isn't like fucking South Park where it feels the need to comment on every single little bit of news. But it's fascinating seeing an early adult swim show made by William Street attempt to tackle shit that none of these other shows really did. On top of that, it looks a lot smoother than any other William Street cartoon at the time. In a way where like, I'm not entirely sure that I like it. Like, it looks kind of off sometimes, I'm not gonna lie, but it was the most expensive adult swim show at the time. That, that, no, that, no, that's just beautiful. 
I think the thing that really sells the show for me though is just how good the voice cast is. Gary Cole does a fantastic job as Birdman. I don't know, something about how dry his delivery is pairs really well with Stephen Colbert as Ken Sivan. Another really great casting choice. I didn't know you were a member here, Birdman. Teeth, teeth. Ha ha ha! Tetanus. The show benefits a lot from the structure of having a court case to structure itself around, while also still having enough room to improvise. With how quick Colbert delivers his lines, he gets a lot of mileage out of his runtime. <laughs> a procure. Pencils and papers and such? God, I love your accent. Ha <laughs> Bye, Curious. Oh hey, just in time for Pride Month. conceive of what I'm capable of! Lightning bolts shoot from my fingertips! You poured sugar in Pendlehurst gas tank? No, some other kids did, but we ended up getting caught. So what's the punishment? He's making us do this scared straight thing at the prison he used to work at. Scared straight? You're already straight. I'm already scared. I, I, have, I have no idea why we make them. All I know is this. We keep coming here after school every single day. We just keep doing it, and then, I don't know, it's just, and then we just do it, and I guess it feels like we should just be doing it, I guess, I don't know. I don't know how many of you guys remember this, but a while ago in my Moral World video, I mentioned offhandedly that I would steal my parents' phones and record shit with them. At the time, it was just usually little skits with my toys. I remember this time, I created a whole little world for my Lego figurines and plushes that would fight, they would go on adventures, and I would record all of it on my parents' shitty little smartphones before eventually having to delete them to make space for other things. I don't know, I probably deleted like five movies just to make space for like the icon app or some shit. And when I first started this tier list, I had a couple ideas of what would land really high for me. Of course, without a doubt, there are shows that I know I love, but I also kind of expect it to be kind of whatever on a lot of these early Adult Swim shows. I think I ended up enjoying what I watched more than I expected, but I could not have prepared for how much I see myself in home movies. Somehow through a mix of everything, the show manages to take something that looks like this and make me fall in love with it. The show follows eight-year-old Brendan Small living with his divorced mom, Paula, and who makes movies with his friends, Jason and Melissa. And ugh, I fucking love this show. Despite all being played by adults, the kids all feel so authentic, which is not to say that they're super realistic. The showrunner Lauren Bochard and Brendan Small made a conscious decision not to act overly babyish or childish. Jason comes in and he says, uh -huh. you're acting like a barbarian. Acting like a barbarian. I love it. And then I stopped writing. Okay. That's that was, where, that was that's not where even I think the joke left. is. No, because the, <clears throat> I know, but the, uh, hey, the irony whoa. of you Brendan, saying to him. Uh, uh, okay, I think, you know what? what? I think, I, 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 think I don't want my, it seems I, edited by you, Melissa. Okay, well, um, this is tough, and uh, I think I hate doing this. Named after the co-creator of the show, Brendan Small is this little wise-ass kid who kind of sucks at making movies, despite it being the only thing he really does. And it makes sense, he's a kid, but Brendan really, really, really works hard for these movies. He scripts them, he directs them, he acts in them, he even edits them. And while he's nice and has a good heart, he's also flawed. He's got insecurities about his life, which he channels through his movies. He has insecurities about the quality of his art. He yearns for control and thus has an ego about his work that clashes whenever people work with him. But all of these intense emotions are channeled through his movies, because in every other aspect of his life, he is absent. Filmmaking consumes every aspect of his life for better and a lot of times for worse, but his friends balance him out. Jason is such a realistic kid. He's a gross, snotty, disease and infection riddled kid who's both soft spoken and short tempered. A doctor will tell you the same thing eating healthy and Wrong. exercising. Wrong. Okay. Listen, Dead Jason, wrong. I just want you two to be healthy. Your words mean nothing to me! Alright. Fuck, man. I don't know. Something about Jason. I, I, I relate to Jason. I don't know. Something about him. <laughs> Melissa's great because while she does fall into the stereotypical girl voice of reason trope a little bit, she also gradually just becomes just as silly and stupid as the rest of the boys. She also is kind of an instigator in some scenarios where she just causes chaos. But really what makes this show for me is just how different it is from everything surrounding it, despite being the first show ever on Adult Swim's block. Home Movies has always been the odd one out of the lineup. With the origins of the show tracing all the way back to when Lauren Bochart, creator of Bob's Burgers, and then co-creator of Home Movies, met Brendan while working on the show Dr. Katz. 
Sick of working on the show, they hopped on the opportunity to pitch to UPN, a show about a kid and his mother. Animating an entire eight minutes before the show was even picked up, all of which was used in the first episode. After this pitch, UPN greenlit them for an order of five episodes, and home movies would premiere on April 26, 1999 on UPN, and everyone fucking hated it. <laughs> Ratings were impressively low. No one watched it, and those who did, did not understand it. The show's uniqueness is what drove people away. The show's animated using squiggle vision, a technique pioneered originally by Soup to Nuts, the production company working on Dr. Katz, where the characters' outlines would wiggle around while the characters talk. This was done in order to save on the need for lots of animation, as now, still frames could feel more dynamic. This would also leave a lot of room for the voice actors to improvise. The voice actors in the show would all have to be in the same studio and record the lines together, so now they can improv off each other, leading to dialogue that felt closer to real life than any other show on television. You know, but mostly fighting. It's, it's a mental game. Okay. You gotta think on your feet here, bro. Right, I got one. Right, what do you got? Go ahead. Loving you is easy cause you're beautiful. Alright, so in that situation, Brendan, I'm gonna kill you. Hell, the first episode is barely scripted at all, utilizing outlines instead of any actual dialogue in order to let the characters just naturally converse with each other. And despite the show changing to Flash and becoming more scripted, the heart of the show and the conversational nature continue to shine through. All these aspects of the show that make me fall in love with it is exactly what people had a hard time coming to terms with when the show first came out. This New Year's animated show stands out largely in quantity and not quality. Home movies, the worst of the lot, promises to fade soon to black. Stop them before they scribble again. According to Bochard, their guy at UPN told them that he'd be fired if he even considered the idea of renewing the show, and that, and I quote, When we looked at the minute-to-minute -minute ratings report, you could see people racing to the remote to change the channel. <laughs> God fucking damn. It's only after five episodes, UPN pulled the plug. But despite being one of the least watched shows of the year, it did get the eyes of one person in particular. Khaki Jones. In an interview with IGN, Brendan attributes the second life of home movies to Khaki, a writer and eventual VP of original programming at Cartoon Network, stating that despite having disagreements about the direction of the show, that she was the person who originally fell in love with it and convinced Lazo to revive it. She fought for home movies during a time no one else was, and helped give it a new home on Adult Swim. And yeah, this is kind of another weird case of it not starting off as an Adult Swim original, but after those five episodes and every season following, it was made for Adult Swim. But this relationship of not being produced in-house by William Street, alongside its dramatically different vibe for the rest of the show on Adult Swim, made it so that home movies never truly fit in around its contemporaries. Brendan has gone on record talking about how he feels Lazo never really got home movies. Its cancellation in season 4 came as sort of a surprise, when Lazo simply stated that regardless of ratings or sales that the show was cancelled. I don't know, maybe he wanted to shed the old to make space for new series, but again and again it seemed common for most of the showrunners and their teams to never truly feel like they fit into this early stage of Adult Swim's life. For different reasons, of course, and while I don't have a super developed theory as to why that is, and I can't get Lazo's sauce from his perspective, it's interesting how home movies, despite standing out like a sore thumb during this time, was probably still the best of its era. Home movies might be my favorite Adult Swim show from the original bunch because it's so different. Because while it's not a super serialized show that takes itself super seriously, there is something special about how it portrays childhood, life, and art in a way that none of the other Adult Swim shows at the time had the ambition to pursue. That's not a bad thing, I don't need Aqua Team to having a season-long emotional arc exploring Master Shake's trauma or some bullshit like that, but when Home Movies is surrounded by shows that are all filling a similar niche, the fact that it does have this radically different pace feels like a breath of fresh air. I mentioned earlier that the kids feel like real people and sometimes even older than they actually are. Their statuses as kids is both obvious and not at the same time. It's like if you put a cynical adult in the body of an 8 year old mixed with the reasoning of a 14 year old. Part of this is that as kids with absent parents, 
They're kind of forced to fulfill roles they shouldn't. The kids in the show talk like adults, meanwhile all the adults in their life fill the opposite role, most being people barely holding on to their social expectations. The biggest example of this is Coach McGurk, the funniest character in the entire show. He's an alcoholic soccer coach who sucks at his job and is friends with eight-year-olds. In everything, he's completely incompetent and generally unpleasant to be around, but regardless, him and Brendan's relationship is one of the highlights of the show. The way this 38-year-old man just lays down on the bleachers shooting the shit with this eight-year-old boy about life like he would another grown-up is fucking hilarious. Despite being a dick to basically everyone though, he does at least try to some extent to be a mentor and a father figure to Brendan giving terrible advice to Brendan's issues, but funnily enough, Brendan often ends up being the one consoling and advising him. Bud, being with him made me think I'd like to spend some time working with kids, you know? But you do spend time working with kids, Coach McGurk. You're a soccer coach. Shut up, Brendan. Okay. I think it's awesome how in like one episode he just ditches work to go to his uncle he doesn't care about's funeral, and he just takes Brendan with him for like no reason. Just tagging along. In the same IGN interview, the real Brendan Small talks about a cut line from the episode that I love because it perfectly encapsulates McGurk's brain. While with the lawyer collecting whatever his uncle left behind, the lawyer asks him if Brendan is his son. Originally, Brendan and McGurk would just laugh about it and he'd just say, no, 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 no. That's my friend. I don't know, despite how much of an asshole coach is, he's just so incredibly entertaining in a way where he steals any scene he's in, while also satisfyingly having shit blow up in his face. Glenn, you're drunk. I'm gonna get you back to the hotel oh. if I can find it. Look at those Excuse hats. me, Mexican. <laughs> Oh shit, that's me! Another example is Brenda's mom, Paula. While not a terrible mom and incredibly sweet, she's a single mother to two kids who can't function in a high stress situation, can't cook, bordering on broke, and barely making ends meet. Every scene with Paula and Brendan though is so incredibly sweet. Okay, I'll be you. Okay, you try to break up you. the fight. All right, all right. Hey, sh hey, Shannon, I don't think this is a good idea to have a fight. You are the biggest wimp I've ever met, Brendan. All right, that's it, I tried. <laughs> Ah, get, mom, seriously, the headlock, this isn't funny. <laughs> we were joking, this is, mom, this is a hypothetical situation. Oh, let me go. The way she talks with Brendan is probably the nicest depiction of a realistic mother-son relationship. They riff off each other, they talk so matter-of-factly. She's a loving parent, but with everything on top of her, mixed with her ineptitude, it makes it hard for her to be a present mother. As a person with parents who I didn't get to spend much time around as a kid, I relate to the feeling of needing a mother, but having one who isn't in the position to be able to nurture you. Giving you the stability that you need is probably one of the biggest things that drives Brendan to filmmaking in general. It's something in his control, it's a constant in his life. And while he struggles with apathy, he finds a way to still let whatever is on his mind manifest in some way through his art. I think the part that speaks to me so much about this show is Brendan's relationship with his creation. Home Movies isn't this super emotional drama, but there's this lingering melancholy that's so palpable. Brendan uses filmmaking as a crutch, growing up in a divorced household and surrounded by adults that can't really do much for him. He kind of recedes into his films as a way to reclaim some sort of agency in his life. Yeah, it's fun for him and his friends, but it's also the one place where he really does have control over how it all goes down. And for a kid with virtually no control, it becomes a very valuable defining feature of who he is as a person. And the most bittersweet part about the show is when he starts losing that spark for filmmaking, wondering if it's even something he enjoys anymore. I envy your youth. Don't get into show business, Josie. Don't spend your life being dragged down by projects that you'd lose interest in and have to sneak away from. Brandon! Where's my childhood gone, Josie? I was in a really bad rut after my last video. I don't know, maybe it was just dealing with YouTube's stupid draconian copyright system or it was some personal stuff on my mind, but I don't know. I felt like I had lost my ability to write. I would stare at an empty Google Docs page and be frozen for hours. This is partially why this video took this long to fucking come out. But if you guys remember in my last video, I said that I loved doing this because it felt like one of the few things in my life I truly had control over. Seeing how Brendan kept on making movies as an escape made me feel more seen than I have in a while by any show. 
Spoiler talk ahead, if you really want to know where I rank the show, it's probably like right here. But skip ahead or whatever if you really want to avoid spoilers, but... Something that made me think a lot about my own relationship to my videos was the series finale, Focus Grill. By all accounts and purposes, it's not this big, bombastic, massive ending or anything. In its simplest form, it's just a story about the kids trying to give an ending to their first film and Coach McGurk building a grill for Paula. But the episode really resonates with me because as the series goes on, we see that all of Brendan's movies kind of suck. And this is by intention. The creators made the active choice not to make Brendan and his friends these little child savants who can make any grand masterpiece of a film. They weren't child prodigies. And this was by choice. These were cute little movies that a group of friends cooked up together in an afternoon. But in the episode, the gang finally sits down and watches all the movies they've made together, and they realize that they kind of fucking blow. And as they go to check on McGurk and the grill, it explodes and they give up on grilling food and instead just go out to eat. And while they're driving and Brendan films the view, the camera falls and gets destroyed. But before Brendan's able to grieve at the loss of his coping mechanism, it strikes him that despite his art being the thing that gave him agency, it was also kind of holding him back from really living life from appreciating the little family that he does have. Him, his mom, and his friends, and while it's dysfunctional, he can let go of that part of his life, that apathetic view that made him feel the need to shut himself out in the first place. This doesn't mean he will never pick up a camera again or abandon his passion, but it does mean that he's allowed to move on. I like making these videos, even when it feels like I can't quote unquote do it right, but this show has helped me better understand that I gotta do me. I can't be making videos that don't represent me, that feel like I'm walking through the motions. I gotta be having fun making these, or what's the point? And I have been having fun. Yeah, I want this to be my job, but I need it to be healthy as well. I don't read the ending as a rejection of using art to cope or even expressing yourself through it, but rather an acknowledgement that it's not healthy to live our lives through this perspective of a camera to disassociate and be a spectator in our own stories. That maybe in order to create great art, we just have to truly live our lives, not just cope while we let apathy dictate who we are and what we do. And yeah, even though the ending is kind of sad, it's also hopeful. I feel like everybody to some extent is apathetic. It's hard not to be. The internet breeds it and we consume it. It's a self-defense mechanism, right? But it's these small little conversational moments like these that reminds me that there's more to life than apathy. See y'all in the next one. I don't I don't even know if there's gonna be a next one, man. Like fuck this. Like this took so fucking long. Thank you to all the Patreon supporters for your support. You guys don't know how much this means to me. But from this point onward, I'm gonna be reworking my Patreon. So if you're currently subscribed to my Patreon, go check out the little update I just put out. It should be out the same time that this video is out. But anyways, a special extra thanks to Funky Mothman, Andrew J, Corbu, Coda, Sam, Tim E, Zephyr Show, and Alex the Hardcore and Awesome, Angel, Kona Dunstan, Ivy Comb, Liam O'Leary, Naija Hobley, Omero Love, Q-Stick, Robin, and Supersonic Dude. Thank you.